All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Visiting Scholar Talk. Um, this is a part of a series of events sponsored by the Division of Arts and Letters and the Center for Student Engagement and Intercultural Programs at Governor State University. I'm Rebecca Seifert, Assistant Professor of Art History here at GSU, and I'm joined by my students um, in the other room in my small but mighty history of design class. And I'd like to start by introducing tonight's guest speaker, Bernardo Justin Campoy. Justin is an adjunct professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City, teaching graphic design concepts and history. He specializes in the history of design and designing in the contemporary sphere. He studied studio art as an undergrad and has an MA in art theory and practice and an MFA in painting and drawing. He continues his own studio practice that reflects on culture, politics, history, and living in the complexity of today's world. So welcome, Justin. Um, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. And in the meantime, if anyone wants to ask a question or make a comment, feel free to raise your hand or type it into the chat box. OK. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. I want to change my view, so I have I want to make sure I can see you all while I'm talking. OK. Super, here we go. All right, so hi everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. It's good to have this opportunity. It's good to see everybody in the virtual world. Uh, Professor Seifert and I are old friends from way back from our time at the Guggenheim Museum. And uh, I'm here largely to talk about World War I propaganda and how a lot of the techniques used in World War I propaganda sort of blossomed into the uh, methods of advertising and propaganda and political campaigns throughout the 20th century and today. So my big purpose in this is that I find it very fascinating that these techniques kind of were born nearly 100 years ago and we see them in use over and over and over because they are successful um, and powerful. But also my interest is really in kind of keeping our eyes open about the modern world or the contemporary world and, and sort of understanding the constant bombardment of design and visual imagery that is intended to kind of manipulate us and sort of constantly be aware of this uh, because it just makes us more savvy citizens and more in control of our own destinies. So uh, to start before the beginning, just Art Nouveau is like the big 18th century, sorry, end of the 19th century, late 1800s, art and design movement that was incredibly popular and incredibly successful. I'm not really going to talk about that. I just kind of want to ground us someplace in history that is hopefully uh, at least somewhat familiar to everybody. So this is a, a famous poster by Toulouse the Trek. It was a giant poster. It was about two meters tall. And these posters were so beautiful and so new and so exciting that people would like literally steal them off the walls. And designers really kind of figured for the first time, like, whoa, we can make public advertising beautiful. And that by making it beautiful and attractive and avant-garde and exciting, it becomes a more effective advertisement. So one of the big names of, uh, there we go. One of the big names from the Art Nouveau movement is this artist named Alphonse Mucha, who is probably the most kind of famous signature Art Nouveau sexy ladies. Uh, for selling all kinds of things from plays to cigarettes to booze to um, to absinthe. And uh, these were the sort of like free flowing organic curving forms. Again, uh, Art Nouveau as a successful design movement. Again, these were so popular, so beautiful, people would steal them off the walls. Jules Charest is another one of these artists that was incredibly successful. So. Uh, Hector Guimard really brought this design to the public and in service of the public through the Paris Metro. The Paris Metro is this beautiful, you know, there's over, I think, 80 of these entrances remaining in Paris that were these beautiful Art Nouveau decorative invitations into the subway. Is 
you all live in Chicago. I live in New York City. This is quite different from what we experience when we go in and out of the, the subway system. So, uh, but as we reach the fin de siècle, to, to, to use the, the term, but as we transition into the 1900s, as we transition into the 20th century, there is this dawning of a new era concept. And I want to just kind of briefly talk about these artists from England, these designers known as the beggar staffs. And the beggar staffs were graphic designers, but they were not successful. And it's really a matter of what I, I say, it's like the right place, but the wrong time. They had the right aesthetic idea, but it was the wrong time for it. The idea of minimal, crisp, clear imagery that people would understand very quickly and very rapidly, we understand today is very successful, very effective design. But in the late 1890s, people didn't want it. They still wanted the beautiful, intricate, decorative, sexy Art Nouveau, like we see with the mucha on the right. So it's really was a matter of the right place at the wrong time. Good, effective aesthetic, just people didn't want it yet. But when you get into the 20th century, by 1905, uh, a design like this by Lucien Bernhard basically instantly changes design. So by 1905, the world was kind of getting tired of Art Nouveau and ready for something new. It's a new era, the new century, right? Everybody is like, what's the new thing? So uh, Bernhard creates this poster for matches. And I, I always joke with my students, it's like, matches? What do you need to advertise for matches for? But you know, understanding the historic context of it, that people use matches a lot more than we do today. One, people smoked pipes and cigarettes and cigars just basically all the time. But also you used it to write to light your stove, to light your oil lamps in your house. And uh, Bernhard created this poster by entering it in a contest. But this was not his first version. His first version was a very busy scene with like a nightclub and people dancing and partying and drinking. And he showed it to his friend and his friend said, oh, it's great, it's beautiful. Looks like an Art Nouveau poster, great. But what's it for? What's it an ad for? So Bernhardt kind of says, hmm, scratches his chin, and he kind of he just pulls out his black paint and he just painted out everything that was necessary, was unnecessary, leaving us with ultimately the bare essential of what's necessary. The name of the product and what the product is, right? The company, the product. Boom, boom. Two big dominant elements, flat background, focused, key. You decipher it like quickly like this for a new era, right? This new dawning of a new era. And also people are traveling the world at faster and faster speeds. So uh, it's an advertisement that you don't have to look and read. It reads itself, right? It sort of sinks into your eyes, uh, you know, at the snap of the fingers. And in 1905, just instantly Art Nouveau was over and this was the new modern, clean, straight to the point aesthetic. And we're gonna see this that aesthetic through World War I and all the way through today. So I have lots of examples of these things. Uh, it, it kind of brings me to a larger point whenever I'm talking about history of design and history of graphic design in particular, is that this is the history of mass media. And it's, I, I think it's important to sort of show people multiple examples of these ideas because it was mass media. It's a very different thing than a painting that is in a gallery or is a museum or is ma made for a patron that was designed for ultimately a much smaller audience. So uh, I show a lot of images that are really just kind of meant to kind of echo that point that there are a, that this was mass media. So this is another Bernhard for um, a cigarette company. And like I said, we still use this today. These are, I mean, everybody knows it's a Nike shoe very specifically, it's the Black Mambas for Kobe Bryant. If anybody's like a sneaker person, I'm not, but there it is. Uh, but the image, the brand, flat background, we see it over and over and over again. Sometimes it's a little cutesy, a little clever. These are very fun and clever. Uh, this is from Ikea. This is from iPhone. And you see this all the time because it's so effective. People like to say that good design is clean design. Good design is minimal design. I don't agree with that 
necessarily. I prefer to think of it as uh, successful design, uh, interesting design, compelling design. Uh, there is a, a real kind of bias in favor of a, a modernist minimalist aesthetic when design can be so much more than that. So uh, this artist, his name is Hans Rudi Ert, made this poster for Opel Automobiles in 1911. And rather than showing the product, he shows the consumer of the product, right? The sort of affluent retired military officer. And Opel, if you're not familiar, they make cars, they still exist, they make sports cars. And in 1911, this was the Opel Torpedo. So you can kind of imagine this retired military officer tearing around the countryside, uh, you know, screaming through the hills at 25 miles an hour, which would have been very, very fast, but you know what, I want to drive it, so that's okay. Uh, here's another artist from this style of this early 20th century that we call Plakatstil, uh, which is the German word for uh, poster. It means poster style. I'll type it in here, Plakatstil. Uh, that means Plakat is the German word for poster. Stil means style, so it just means poster style. Sometimes this is called the, the, the Sach Plakat, which is like object poster or thin poster. Um, so Lucien Bernhard is another one of these very successful uh, designers. You can see his logo, uh, and you'll also notice that his logo is down here on the bottom right. And he, again, rather than show, featuring the product, he features someone enjoying the product or using the product. And these three particular designers we're going to see again when we're looking at the World War I propaganda. Um, this is probably my favorite poster in all of the history of graphic design because I think it's just very interesting and funny and cool and makes me laugh. And I think it's a great image. So uh, sehr, I'll, I'll read it in German and then translate for you. Zu, zum ersten Mal in Deutschland Fußbettspiel auf Motorrädern. Um, which means for the first time in Germany, a soccer game on motorcycles. And if you're thinking a soccer game on motorcycles, that sounds insane. They couldn't really have done that. I tell you, they really did it. And it's amazing. Um, also the text at the bottom reads, and it was the last time ever because everyone broke their legs. Um, that's actually not true. That's not what it says at the bottom. But anyway, beautiful poster. Uh, and this poster style, the, the placard steel was very, very successful. Uh, proliferated very rapidly. And like I said, we still use it today. These are a couple by Ludwig Holwein for breweries in, in sort of the Bavarian era. If you've ever been to Germany, you kind of, my, my, my advice about visiting Germany is, is don't go for Oktoberfest because every month is Oktoberfest in Germany. So go in November or September. Just anyway, that's my advice about visiting Germany. Um, Still in use today. Here's another design from Ludwig Holwein, still being used by this brewery, Francis Kanner Weisbier. And if you look, of course, you can see his little logo remaining. Uh, Holwein, great designer. Ultimately, he ended up working for the Nazis and doing a lot of Nazi propaganda. So we, uh, we can say bad things about him and not feel bad and actually feel good about saying that. Yeah, we should feel good when we say bad things about Nazis because they're Nazis. Um, so, but it, you can see it has a much more kind of fascistic aesthetic, right? It's like, you know, Hercules beer or I'll punch you in the face. Whereas the, whereas the previous posters were like, um, hey, you know, we're drinking and having a good time. It's a very, very different vibe. Uh, I, I try not to curse in class, but I, I, I I make no reservations about not cursing when it comes to Nazis and Klansmen. I, I will, I will say bad bad words about them. So here we are. Yeah, I, I get approval for that. Um, so the main thrust of what we want to talk about today is World War One. World War One posters and propaganda techniques. We're going to look at it from two opposing sides. We're gonna sort of compare the German side and we're going to compare the allied side. Um, I'm gonna just briefly, uh, what's the best way to do about this? So World War I is one of these topics that I can get like really carried away with because I've, I've probably read the most on the actual war. 
But I, I think the big thing that I want to warn people against when they're thinking about World War I is to not wash backwards in history. We just spent a lot of time talking. Uh, I just spent, you know, I went out of my way to say Nazis are bad. No, no kidding. But uh, what ends up happening sometimes is people think that uh, because there were Nazis in World War II, they sort of wash backwards in history and say, therefore, Germany was evil in World War I. And, you know, history doesn't work backwards like that. World War I doesn't really work as well in a kind of like good guys, bad guys scenario. Like World War II is kind of easier to do that with because the Nazis in Imperial Japan, but, you know, Stalin, who was an ally, uh, was also kind of bad too. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, you know, good and good guys and bad guys in war doesn't really fit in World War One. So I kind of want to just make sure you're not washing your backwards in history with that, because we can fall into a trap and sort of say like, well, of course Germany was because they always like to fight wars, and that's just it's just a bit of a cultural stereotype that we should avoid. So uh, when we're talking about World War One, uh, it's important to also remember that the beginning of the war there was immense excitement for it. Everybody on all sides of the war basically was like, yay, we're going to war. We're going to go kick ass. We're going to go show them they suck and that we're the best. Like everybody had that attitude. So you see a recruitment rallies like this were in every country. 1914, this is in Germany. Again, to avoid that, that stereotype, we have a recruitment rally in England from the same time. So just again, to show you that this level of enthusiasm was was all over the place. Even in the United States, 1917, which by 1917, people knew how bad the war was, you still saw these huge, huge recruitment rallies of, of excitement. And of course, this was ultimately the destination. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a bit of a movie recommendation. If you're not familiar with World War One and you kind of want to get a nice history crash course on it, uh, the movie 1917 that came out pre-pandemic, what is that? like a month ago, five years ago, who remembers, but before the pandemic, uh, 1917, I, I give a good recommendation for that as sort of like the World War I experience. Uh, so, right, popping up out of the trench, running across, getting shot by ma machine guns, and this is ultimately a result. So let's go back to the graphics. Uh, this is Lucian Bernhard, right? He did the matches poster. And das ist sehr weg zum Frieden, die Feinde wollen es so. Uh, this is the way to peace. The enemy wills itself. So let's talk about the way this is working. We still have that clear imagery from Plockett still, right? Minimal text, large central image, flat background, uh, so you can decipher it very quickly. But there's a couple of other things going on here because of the, the propaganda. One, if you look at this fist, it's strong, it's powerful, it's punching down, right? It's not punching up. It's not like Little Mac in uh, Mike Tyson's punch out who's got to like jump up and punch the people. He's in, he's, he has the high ground, he's punching down. Uh, this armor is very like tough looking, it's medieval. It echoes history. It's actually to a German in 1915, this would very clearly say, oh, this is the Teutonic Knights. The Teutonic Knights are these famous medieval knights that were kind of super badass knights, or at least that's the, the mythology of them. So it's echoing history. It's this call to history. It's like support the war because we've always been great at war, I guess. Uh, then you have this text, which is not a modern legible text at all. It's this sort of medieval old Gothic style. But this would also be an attempt to connect with history uh, because printing movable type is invented in Germany, right? The Gutenberg press, Gutenberg movable type. So this is another kind of connection to that. Uh, so it's trying to inspire people to support the war out. It's trying to support, inspire people to support the war by echoing history. Uh, and then the text, this is the way to peace. The enemy wills it so. It's sort of this meaning the fight is the way to peace. But then it kind of says, but it's their fault, right? This is the way to peace. We're gonna we're gonna get peace through the fight. But but they started it right. It has this really kind of like weakness inherent in that statement, uh, because it's like we didn't want to fight, but they started. But we're gonna fight. You know, it's it's sort of like are we tough? Are we strong? Are we casting blame? Are we taking credit? Right. It has this kind of mixed messaging. So the German side, or what was known as the Central Powers, but the the German side of the war. 
a lot of the propaganda posters have this kind of sometimes a mixed message or just a kind of weak and watery, uh, ineffective type of propaganda. And this is relevant to know, not just for usefulness of contrast when we get to the Entente powers, but also because it comes up all the time because he's a real asshole, uh, Hitler, right? So Hitler says, said one of the reasons that Germany lost World War I was that they had inferior propaganda. And if you know anything about World War II propaganda, and you'll be studying it later on in your class, um, we know that Germany had a very big, powerful, and evilly effective propaganda apparatus. And again, Hitler puts that in place because he says, we lost the war, Germany lost the World War I because we had bad propaganda. They had better propaganda. So we'll kind of keep that idea floating around in our heads. So here's Hans Rudi Echt. Uh, you can see he's the Opel poster. Uh, if you look closely, a quick little technical thing, if you look closely at this poster, you'll see horizontally across the middle, you see how it's kind of two-toned there. You'll see that in a lot of these old posters because these are lithographs. Lithography is a big printing stone. So oftentimes if it was a really big print, they would print it in sections and then glue it together. So that's what you're seeing. And you, you'll see it actually quite often. So uh, here, this is again, another poster sort of bragging about German technology. Uh, Germans had submarines, kind of the most effective submarines in World War I. And this poster is basically saying, we're gonna win the war with our submarines. What are we gonna do? We're gonna sink ships with our submarines. We're gonna win the war with our, by sinking the enemy ships. But if you look closely, you'll see that the ship that's sinking, it's not a battleship. It's not a warship. It's a merchant ship. And this was a key concept because uh, Germany in World War I used Sometimes and sometimes not, they used what's called unrestricted warfare. Unrestricted warfare means that anything is a viable target if it could potentially help the military. So a merchant vessel that's carrying coal would be a viable target. Uh, carrying fabric, food, right? Any, anything's a, 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 a legitimate target in unrestricted warfare. Now, this was incredibly controversial and, and frankly still is controversial. Now in World War II, everybody used unrestricted warfare. But in World War I, only the Germans did. But let's think about the poster. We're gonna win the war by sinking their ships with our submarines. Great, so this is now on display in the streets of Berlin. We're gonna gather support for the war by showing how we're gonna win the war with our submarines. But the only problem is that's a merchant ship. Who works on a merchant ship? Civilians. Regular people do, not soldiers, not people in the Navy, not seamen. It's non military. So while a German citizen would look at this and say, Yeah, we've got great submarines, they're also immediately reminded that they are killing civilians with these submarines. So this is a mixed message, very clearly a mixed message. Support the war, we're going to win it with our technology, but oh, we're killing innocent civilians, right? So uh, it, it's, it's the same concept with, that we have in today. You know, we have these drones that fly over wherever the terrorists are, and they're being piloted from Montana or Wyoming or something. And they kill a terrorist, and they're like, yeah, you know, there's like, and then they go on the news and like, we killed a terrorist. Yay. Uh, but, oh, he was hiding out with a bunch of school children. We killed them too, right? We, it, we don't want to hear it. It's awful. It happens, it's terrible, it makes us very sad, it's, it's gross and complicated, but that's exactly what this poster is doing in 1916, that same kind of mixed messaging. So this one I just think is very bizarre and weird, like the red glowing eyes. If you've never, if you've ever seen the Watership Down cartoon from the 70s that was horrifying, um, I don't know if anybody has seen it. So anyway, I guess it's a Gen X. Um, here we go. Anyway, uh, um, I'm, I'm not the best at Zoom, I'm, I apologize. 
So supply rabbit furs, the army needs them, right? Here's a poster of like, collect your rabbit furs and give them to the army. Uh, collect nettles if you want clothing and thread. Again, do they help the war? Sure, but are they like powerful and evocative and emotional? Not really. It's like collect nettles if you want clothing and thread. You know, we're at war and I've got to collect nettles. Like it's just the disconnect. It's just very weak. Uh, again, another poster bragging about technology. Uh, despite all the mythology about biplanes in World War I, uh, airplanes had almost no impact in actual the actual outcome of World War I. They weren't, they weren't very good. Uh, they were their most effective actually was at disseminating propaganda. We'll talk more about how they would disseminate the propaganda in a bit. So more about mixed messages. Here's a poster. Again, we're still looking at Holwein. This is a poster to raise money for the Red Cross, right? Help wounded soldiers. You see this soldier, he's got his arm in a sling. He's kind of sad and depressed because he's wounded, right? He was at the fight and you know, he's wounded and he's like, oh, it sucks to be a wounded soldier. And you're like, oh, I feel bad for him. I'm going to donate some money to the Red Cross. Give out your, your, your marks and, you, and like, you feel good about yourself. I'm helping that wounded soldier. But remember, when you display a poster in public, and this was mass media of the time, this is the YouTube, the Twitter, the TikTok, or whatever, this is the mass media of the time. You display it in public, you can't control who sees it. You can't limit your audience. So is this poster effective at raising money for the Red Cross? Absolutely, it evokes an emotion. We feel sorry for the poster, but who else is gonna see it? Who else would see this poster? Well, imagine you're a young German boy, I'll say, marching to the recruitment office. You're like, hey, I'm gonna go fight in the war, yay. And then you pass this poster. You might be like, oh, I might get shot. And I actually always think it's more effective, not like the, the young boy seeing it, but his mother seeing it. His mom is like, oh, meine kleine Franz kann nicht uh, der Krieg gehen. My little Franz cannot go to the war. He's gonna to go to the farm and hide out with his uncle and go collect nettles or whatever, right? He's not gonna let him go. Um, so again, that's that mixed messaging. That's that mixed messaging. And remember the whole purpose of propaganda is to manipulate. And in this case, sustain the war effort. So this is a poster, again, it's the same poster. It's just for a different fund. This is the Ludendorff Fund for Wounded Soldiers. The soldier looks at the tools. He wants to work, but he can't work because he's a wounded soldier. Again. Yes, you'll donate money to the Ludendorff Fund for Wounded Soldiers, but it would probably discourage potential new soldiers or the just support for the war in general, because it's going to remind people that their sons are in harm's way and could get injured. So in strong comparison, time check, okay. In strong comparison, we have this poster from England. Britain's wants you. So this is the opposing side of the war. And I know you're probably thinking you're like, oh, it reminds me of Uncle Sam, but this came first. Uncle Sam is the child of this one. We'll talk about that. But it's a very clear, direct message. It's still placard steel. The central image, minimal text, flock background, but it has, there's no mixed message. It's serious. His eyes are heavy. He's got this stern look. He's pointing at you. It's not, we need some guys for the war. Who's going to help with the war? We need some guys. It's, we need you. And if you can see that I'm pointing and looking right in the camera, right? We need you, right? It, it has this intensity to it. It's a direct call. It's this personal connection. This personal connection. On top of it, that personal connection is from a real guy. This was, uh, his name is Lord Kitchener. He was the secretary, the Lord of the Admiralty, which was like the equivalent of the Secretary of Defense or something. Um, but so when you're someone in England in 1915, you see this, you're not seeing the mythological caricature of Uncle Sam. You're seeing a real guy calling on you in particular. So personal connection. So James Montgomery Flagg makes this one for the United States when they enter the war in 1917. And just like a quick comparison, it's much more illustrational, so it doesn't feel as real, it doesn't feel as serious. Uh, it feels more cartoonish, uh, more illustrative. 
but it's the same idea, personal connection. Notice how the word you gets bigger, changes colors, pointing at you, looking at you. Used all over the place, still used today. Here you have a Russian poster, here you have a French poster, but used in all kinds of venues. Only you can prevent forest fires. The thing you want when you order salad, right? Here's where the McDonald's comes in. This is what I mean when they're establishing a personal connection, the power of the personal connection is manipulation. The thing you want when you order salad, well, I, yeah, I mean, I love a big, uh, right? It's, it's, it's clear, it's still placard still, and it's calling on you. That use of the word you is a personal connection. And you see it over and over and over and over again. This is, again, why I think this class, why I love this class, why I love this subject is because we're bombarded with this and we have to be aware. We just need to be, we need to wake up, I guess. Um, so what you want is a Coke, quality you can trust. Never mind like the fact that there's a nurse handing it to you, sort of the, 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 the not so subtle implication is that it's healthy. Um, are you beach bod ready? This is a subway ad from several years ago. Again, uh, a lot of flack for this one because of its depictions of, of, of the female body and its depictions of, of um, a beauty standard. Uh, and, it was, and it caught a lot of controversy when it was on display. But again, our sugar can be the willpower you need to under eat. Um, it's a diet dodge, eat sugar instead of food. Right? It's, you know, it's totally bizarre. But um, again, it's this use of the personal connection and advertisers use it all the time because it's effective, because it's effective. Before you scold me, mom, maybe you better light up a Marlboro. Gee, mommy, you sure enjoy your Marlboro. You're driving a bargain when you shop in a Chevrolet. And then all of this text here, do you take pride in having a sharp eye for value? Then you'll get a special thrill. Uh, you enjoy the luxury of blah, blah, blah. And you enjoy all these at low cost per mile, right? Over and over and over and over. Its limits are your limits. Yes, even when advertising a vacuum, they want to establish that personal connection. They want to make you feel connected to the product. Uh, yeah, I have a tattoo and no, you can't see it. So I, you, this, this dialogue, lots of cigarette advertising. Uh, I'm going to look at a lot of cigarette advertising. So bringing it back to the war for a second and looking at a, uh, other techniques used in the war. So the more you keep information under your hat, the safer he'll be. It's this reminder that, that while your normal life is going on back in the home country, it's this reminder that the war is going on that people are in danger and that you are one sort of team and unified. And that this is specifically about a warning of like, hey, don't say anything. You don't know who's around the corner. There's spies everywhere, right? Don't say anything because it could cost lives. Um, will you help? The Red Cross counts on you. You see, again, here's this emotional connection with the burning of the town the family, the, uh, the soldier and his wife and his daughter, will you help? Notice behind the little fence here, you'll see that the, cro the crucifix has been knocked down, right? Really just sort of like adding to that emotional aspect of the manipulation of like, hey, it's, uh, you know, this is how serious it is. They, have, they don't even have respect for, for religion. So, uh, this is a poster of Seville Lumley. Lumley, Daddy, what did you do during the Great War uh, from 1914? Uh, guilt is guilt and emotion are very powerful and effective propaganda techniques. This one goes beyond just the personal connection. It makes you feel guilty. So uh, you see the father the daughter, the son. So you've got this family thing going on. We'll talk more about the family thing as well. The son is on the ground. He's playing with the little British tin soldiers, which are like the, uh, this sort of like patriotic, you know, he's so proud to be a part of the British empire and he's playing with his little British soldiers. He's like, ah, oh, we're so great. We're Britain. We've got these red soldiers. I love being, and you know, I was really proud and patriotic feeling. 
The daughter, who's a little older, she's sitting in his lap and she's reading a book. She's pointing at the book and she looks at him and she says, Daddy, what did you do during the Great War? My friend Betsy down the street, her dad's missing an arm that he lost in the war. What did you do during the Great War? And so he kind of like almost makes eye contact with us, almost breaks the fourth wall. And he's like, you know, furls his brow and he's like, oh, what do I say? What do I say? Because he didn't fight. He didn't go. This is early in the war. This is very, very beginning of the war, 1914. He didn't go. So he feels guilty, right? He, what does he do? His children are proud of him. They love him. They want to, uh, they want to be proud of him. They're proud of their country. And they were like, oh, Betsy's dad fought the Germans and lost his arm. Daddy, you must have done something great because I love you. You're so important. And he's got to tell the truth. of like, ah, I was too afraid to fight. I let other people go fight for me. Or does he lie? Right? So, again, it's emotionally manipulative propaganda. Um, in fact, in World War II, this poster was specifically pointed at as being too manipulative, excessively manipulative, and England kind of toned back their uh, manipulation. Uh, another strange and interesting propaganda technique that they used in World War I in England was they would send groups of young women uh, around into the towns and they would have these white flowers. And anytime they came upon a young man who was out of uniform, they would start to harass him like, hey, why haven't you enlisted? When are you going to fight? When are you going to fight? And if they thought he was a coward, they would stick these white flowers in him. So you have to imagine the kind of pressure of like, you're a young man who's 17 and it was a different time. You barely ever got to talk to girls. And suddenly all these girls are surrounding you and they want to know, when are you going to serve? And if you say like, eh, I'm not going to, then they start like to insult you. It's like highly manipulative, again, highly manipulative. So, um, Guilt is a powerful emotion. It's nice in the surf, but what about the men in the trenches? You're at the beach enjoying your weekend. There's guys fighting in the trenches and you're on vacation. You're a jerk. Your chums are fighting. Why aren't you? Your friends are out fighting. Why aren't you? Again, there's that personal connection. Great. So um, on the American side, Howard Chandler Christie is one of the big American artists from this time. Great artist, very illustrational, very painterly. Um, and he starts to bring in a little bit, he starts to bring the sexy back a little. I'm sure that's a very dated reference for the students, but once upon a time, that was a big song. Um, uh, he, but he starts to bring kind of like the sexiness into this. Like, I want you for the Navy, but she's dressed in, in, the, in the sailor's jacket. And, you know, sort of you play out this narrative. Um, this was a very sexy image for the time, kind of based on what was called a, a, a Gibson girl. And, you know, I don't have time to get into that, but it was, it was sexy. You don't have to trust me on that. Um, here's a couple more. If you want to fight, join the Marines. Gee, I wish I were a man. I'd join the Navy. Um, and you have these kind of like pretty coquettish girls, particularly the one on the right, where she's in that low cut naval uniform, right? It's very sexy. Now, not really sexy by 2022, but again, remember, this is 100 years ago, very different time, very different sort of like um, the, the, the how uh, sexual parameters and sexual mores were, were, were different. Uh, great, super. Fight or buy bonds, third liberty loan. So this kind of like image of the the, the woman, the kind of sexy woman with the arm raised, if you know your art history, you're probably thinking like, oh, it's just like um, the Delacroix painting, uh, Liberty Leading the People. Or if you've seen Les Miserables, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very much echoing that scene. And, and I guarantee that Howard Chandler Christie was familiar with that painting. Um, you have the soldiers in the background and they're kind of being led by or inspired by this mythological, uh, image of freedom and liberty. And of course, she's in this white sheer dress. So there's a little um, of that sexiness there. So this is one of these stories in history that should be taught like first. 
this is the story of the Harlem Hellfighters. And if you're not familiar with them, I, I want to encourage you to, to learn more about them. But the Harlem Hellfighters was a regiment out of New York City and they uh, went to France and they fought in the war. Um, and they, of course, this is 19, this is 1917, 1918. Uh, this is Jim Crow America. They are treated, um, well, the army was segregated. Uh, it wasn't believed that they would be good at fighting because the racists in charge of the army said that black people wouldn't be good at fighting. So they were uh, allowed into the military. They were recruited into the military, but not to fight, to do labor, to dig ditches and move stuff. Uh, but they were not given equal rights. They were not given the opportunity to, to fight for the US Army. Um, and you know, sometimes I, I, I run into somebody who's, who will be super cynical and say, yeah, but that probably saved their lives because they didn't you know, get shot at or whatever. And yeah, it's, that's true, but that's just a really cynical take on it because say like, to say like, well, they were treated as second-class citizens, but at least they didn't get shot at, right? It's, it's, they were treated as second-class citizens. That's the thing. Now, if you look closely here, if you see their helmets, the helmets they're wearing here are not American helmets. Those are French helmets. So the Harlem Hellfighters and black units in the war were allowed to fight, but not under the American flag. They would be loaned out to the French army. America, the American leadership would say, oh, you can have these guys because we don't think they're very good. Well, surprise, surprise, they were really, they were really good. They were really good at fighting. So here you can see this soldier in the foreground is wearing a French helmet. A bunch of them are wearing these French helmets because when they would go and fight for the French, they had to turn over their American equipment and get French equipment. So this would lead to problems where sometimes they'd have like American bullets and they try to put it in a French gun and it wouldn't work. Anyway, how were these soldiers recruited in America? Duty calls, right? Duty calls, join the war. Here is the same exact poster, but to recruit African-American men. And these posters show that they're gonna be treated with respect. It was a lie. The colored man is no slacker. Uh, it's a lithograph, this is from 1918. At the same time, you have posters like this by Howard Chandler Christie, we're all Americans, the honor roll. And then if you read these names, you've got Dubois, Smith, O'Brien, Chechka, Hauka, Papandrakopoulos, Andrasi, Velota, Levy, Turovich, Kowalski, Krishanovich, Nolson, Gonzalez, right? This, these re names representing racial diversity. We're all Americans. If you're finding this ironic, given the political climate of the past five, six, seven years, hundred years, that's kind of my point, is that it is extremely ironic that African-Americans are being recruited, racial diversity being used as a strength of America to raise money for the war, but then they're not allowed to fight for America. If you're seeing the hypocrisy in that, then, then, I'm, then I'm doing at least an okay job of preparing the meal that I'm preparing. Let's do a deeper dive on this one. Um, because it's kind of the most effed up one that I can come up with. True Sons of Freedom, uh, Charles Gustry, 1918. So first of all, I've already mentioned how the uh, black soldiers were not allowed to fight. They were only allowed to fight for the French. Well, here you can see they're fighting, right? Uh, under the US flag. So already we, can see, we know that that's a lie. True Sons of Freedom. And here we go, like, let's remember the historic context, 1918. A generation, two generations, right? After the Civil War. The Civil War ended 1865. Emancipation Proclamation was 1863. So in other words, these are the children and the grandchildren of former slaves. So True Sons of Freedom has this very kind of ironic and dark, almost kind of disgusting in its manipulation of like, hey, you know what freedom was because, you know, your parents weren't, right? It has this kind of like, 
So you, therefore, because you know what freedom really is, you should go fight for freedom abroad. Liberty and freedom shall not perish. Abraham Lincoln smiling down from heaven in this sort of um, paternalistic, I think is a polite way to refer to it. Um, you see a lot of imagery, uh, a lot of propaganda imagery that targeted African-Americans using the image of Abraham Lincoln as almost like a saint. Now they're fighting these Germans. And if you notice all the Germans are like kind of overweight and they're gray and old, etc. cetera. Um, now, there's a particular story about Henry Johnson and how he did such a great job. And there's just so much of this to, uh, to learn about the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, but I'm, I'm actually going, I think the time's bad. Uh, anyway, uh, this is retelling the story of Henry Johnson, who single-handedly fought like a bunch of Germans and, and stopped a, a German raid overnight. And then he ended up with winning like almost a hundred years later, receiving the, um, the Medal of Honor for his actions. Now, what does this have to do with superhero movies? This has everything to do with superhero movies. Uh, here's another recommendation for you. If you have not seen the Watchmen TV show on HBO, if and you like superhero movies, you'll like it. If you like socially progressive storytelling that talks about race in complex and interesting ways, you'll really like this show too. If, and then the combination of them is wonderful. So The Watchmen, well, how does this connect? Well, there's a scene early in The Watchmen that shows African-American soldiers in World War I. And he, this soldier grabs a flyer being dropped on him. Remember how I mentioned how propaganda flyers would be flown above and dropped onto the soldiers? So this is a real flyer in that TV show, and there it is on the, on the left. Here's another one, to the colored soldiers of the US Army. So this is a flyer this, that was dropped from German airplanes specifically over black soldiers. I'm just gonna read the first paragraph for you because as propaganda, you know, normally we think of propaganda as lying, being dishonest, but when your propaganda can tell the truth and be as effective, well, that's the case here. Hello, boys. What are you doing over here? Fighting the Germans? Why? Have they done you any harm? Of course, some white folks in the lying English American press told you that Germans ought to be wiped out for the sake of humanity and democracy. But what is democracy? Personal freedoms, all citizens enjoying the same rights socially and before the law. Do you enjoy the same rights as white people do in America, the land of freedom and democracy? Or aren't you rather treated over there as second-class citizens? Aren't you actually a second-class citizen in your own army while you're fighting over here for democracy? Can you go into a restaurant where white people dine? Can you get a seat in a theater where white people sit? Can you get a Pullman seat or a berth in a railroad car? Or can you even ride in the South in the same streetcar with white people? And how about the law? Is lynching and the most horrible cruelties connected there with a lawful proceeding in a democratic country? Powerful propaganda because it's speaking the truth. Um, and in fact, many African-American soldiers at the end of the war were like, you know what? We get treated better in France. We're gonna stay here. And, they, and many of them stayed. Many did not because home is home and family is family. Okay, so Max Brooks, the son of Mel Brooks, who wrote the, uh, uh, the Zombie Survival Guide and, and a bunch of other books, he created with Kane and White uh, a graphic novel on the Harlem Hellfighters. And it's, it's a wonderful, beautiful graphic novel. Uh, even through democracy, even though democracy wasn't exactly safe back home, we went by many names, the 15th, the 369th, and before going over there, we called ourselves the Black Rattlers. Our French allies called us men of bronze and our German enemies called us the Harlem Hellfighters. Puts a tear in your eye, it's very powerful stuff. Again, notice in the previous panel, they're wearing the American helmets. But when they get that title, Harlem Hellfighters, they're wearing the French helmets because that's where they had to fight. You can see, Closely, it says RF, uh, French, French Republic, Republique Francaise. So 
uh, back to this poster. Why do I have this here? Oh, yes. So just to kind of reset our palette again, I want to kind of bring us back to this. So uh, th this is J.C. Leyendecker. Uh, these men have come across. They are at the front now. Join them, enlist in the Army, enlist in the Navy. So this one doesn't specifically use the word you, but it's implied, right? Join them, enlist in the Navy. Also, Nate Myers, I know him. Um, also, this is also using a, another kind of um, uh, recruitment technique that is probably not so subtle, would have been a little more subtle in 1917, but it's this homoeroticism. And maybe you were thinking it and you didn't want to actively think it. So I'll just go ahead and say, yes, it's extremely homoerotic. And yes, the symbolism of the large shell about to be put into the breach with strong glistening bodies, it's 100% homoeroticism. So another J.C. Leyendecker from the Saturday Evening Post brings up this topic of family. Family as a propaganda technique, family for recruiting. You're fighting for your family. You're fighting for your love. You're fighting for your mother, your daughter, your girlfriend, et cetera. Here we go. Oh, my button stopped working for a minute. So here's just, again, lots of variations on this theme. Go, it's your duty, lad, join today. So here's mom. You got to go. You got to go fight. It's your duty. Women, help America's sons win the war. Women of Britain, say go. We'll be okay. Go fight. Win the war. Goodbye, dad. I'm off to fight for old glory. You buy U.S. government bonds. So we're in this together. I'm going to go fight, but you support with, with buying bonds. Fight for her. And again, another strong art historical reference with Whistler's mother. Uh, but again, fight for her. Even if you don't know Whistler's mother, you still get the idea of fight for grandma, fight for family. Here's a French one. Um, I have the translation for France who fights even though it gets bigger every day. It's a rough translation to make sense there. But you see the father, he's got a really nice beard and mustache. Looks like he's in Williamsburg. I guess you guys up in, you'd say Logan Square up in, up where you're, you're from. Um, so, uh, but you can see he's got his daughter, the mother, the mother's breastfeeding, right? But he's got to go do his duty. He's got to go fight for family, not for you, but for family, for home and country. Super, for home and country. So now again, we're bringing back in the McDonald's of it. At McDonald's, dinner is a good deal, not a big one. So family night out to McDonald's. Again, the power of emotion, of manipulation in advertising whether it's war propaganda or getting you to buy a Big Mac or a Whopper, very effective. Uh, have, it, have it your way. It's the only way. These are uh, from Burger King, obviously. Have it your way. Again, you see the family. Uh, here's another one for McDonald's. Uh, give our best to your family. Do your dinner time in at McDonald's. Uh, the one on the left here, give our best to your family. It has a real Midwestern vibe of like, tell your folks I said hi, uh, which I feel like I'm speaking to a Midwestern audience a little bit so that like, I can understand that. Like I couldn't explain that to my New York students. They'd be like, what? We're, we're mean and rude here in New York. What does that tell your folks I said hi? I don't understand. Um, but if you notice that these ads, um, I, I've picked out a few that are specifically African-American families. Um, and that's because they're... Uh, by this designer named Emick McBain, who's an African-American graphic designer, who is somebody I've become just a big, big fan of as his, his design and his artwork. Um, and it was very important to him to represent his people, to have people be able to see themselves. Now, he also understood the effectiveness of like, if you're speaking to a black audience in a black magazine, you should have black people in your ads. Uh, again, makes that connection, that personal connection. But he talked about the um, Black culture through his advertising and in his designs. He spoke about it in an affirmative way, you know, and with affirmation. And I'll, I have more examples of showing you that, but introduce your beautiful family, right? Here is a Black family, your beautiful family, 
to ours. Yes, it's an advertisement. We can be sort of cynical about that, but he is over and over and over pursuing this, right? Father, son, like father, like son, like mother, like daughter, kama mama, kama binti. So this is um, Swahili that he's using to, uh, for the tagline. So again, speaking to African-American culture, speaking to uh, the, 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 the lost roots of African heritage and trying to reconnect with that in a positive, affirmative way. Family in advertising over and over and over and over and over because it's this idea that it's bigger than you, that it's your family. More from Emmett McBain. Uh, you, you're the one. You deserve a break today. And uh, the you that we see in these advertising advertisements doesn't always have to be there. It can be implied. Treat them rough. Join the tanks. So this is a very famous, wonderful ad uh, recruitment poster for the Tank Corps. I love it. It's just totally nuts. Uh, it's completely bonkers and beautiful. Um, my larger theme here is just kind of like the implied you of the personal personal connection. But man, when you look at that, you've got the tanks and you've got the, the the black cat. It's it's in the colors and the burning. It's just it's just a fantastic piece of piece of artwork. But this implied you for the personal connection. Come to where the flavor is. We don't need the you because he's speaking to us more casually. It doesn't need to say, hey, you come to where the flavor is. It just says, come to where the flavor is. It doesn't need to, it's, it's, it's implied. Come to where the flavor is, come to where the flavor is, right? An extremely successful ad campaign for Marlboro cigarettes. Um, quick, quick color theory note on these. They're the primary color palette. It's a muted primary color palette. So it's red, blues, and yellows. Red, blue, and yellow give just give really a kind of stable, positive vibe. Um, but that color harmony, that color theory is, is, is very intentional to kind of create this sort of subtle positivity. Um, so the tagline for Marlboro, come to where the flavor is, was so successful, it didn't need the word you. It was so successful, it didn't need to even say come to where the flavors, our mind was, had grown so familiar with it that it wasn't necessary. So Emmett McBain, while Marlboro is producing these, the cowboy killer ads for white people, Emmett McBain is making these ads targeting black people. And this is where Emmett McBain sort of starts to transition from an advertiser into like blending art and design and advertising because he starts to be a street photographer essentially. And the models he's choosing are not models at all. They're not actors at all. He would just go on the streets and say like, hey, you got a nice look. You wanna be uh, in my ad? And he would like set it up and take their picture. So this is probably like an actual hot dog guy and an actual guy on the street that he was like, hey, come buy a hot dog. I wanna take a couple pictures and here's some money, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so when you look at these, if they feel more real than these Marlboro ones, because these are actors, these are models, these are real people that he ran into on the street. So again, because they're real people, there's more of a connection. You feel that connection, particularly if you're from these communities of, of large African-American populations from the seventies. So more on Marlboro. Marlboro had a very successful post-World War II ad campaign that targeted veterans specifically. And I'll explain how it targets veterans specifically. But you get a lot to like with Marlboro, right? Again, you, and then of course, get a lot to like. It's implying it's a bargain because, you know, smoking cigarettes was a bargain, I guess. Um, but how did it target veterans? It's probably a little hard to see on a small screen. But if you look at this guy's hand, the back of his hand, there's a tattoo of two crossed anchors. So it implies he was in the Navy. I've got other pictures that'll make it more clear. But if you see here, you can see the tattoos in the back of the hand. So 
the implication is that they got the tattoo when they were overseas, fighting Nazis, fighting the Japanese, and now you come back, you get a lot to like, right? It's this way to just make that connection with veterans, whether it's a veteran out working on a ranch or a veteran who's a bookish businessman, doctor, or whatever, right? Uh, you can, again, that connection of like service. Uh, nothing says women's liberation quite like a nicotine addiction. Uh, this very famous successful ad campaign, You've Come a Long Way, Baby, was praised for its feminism. And it, and it was, you know, it would compare women's, uh, women of the past with women of today, right? You know, here in 1915, women of, this is, I think this is probably late 60s on the left, this one is from the 90s on the right. But this kind of new liberated woman, and then I add my irony in there because anytime we're talking about cigarette ads, you know, we have to remember that cigarette advertising is some of the most impressive designs because they're advertising poison. It's like, it's an amazing thing that they were so successful at it because it was poisonous, but the res results are effective. So why do we look at this? Why do we study this? Because who knows what, we're being manipulated through now with mass media that we're not pausing to take note of. Uh, here's a couple of more of you've come a long way, baby, right? This sort of like, hey, you're the women's liberation movement. Uh, and you can see that this tagline was used for African-Americans and, and, uh, and white Americans. Uh, being a mature adult means, being, means having sophisticated taste. Uh, on the right, Kent, your good taste is showing, right? She's drinking her glass of red wine. She's got her uh, diamond earrings, right? She's very sophisticated. Um, there's a lot of ads with like, with the big afros from this time. And it's this new kind of like natural um, self-actualization. And that self-actualization is again with this, you know, good taste. And then this one on the left, with this, this guy's a hairdresser. You can see the barbicide in the background here. But when your taste grows up, so should your cigarette, right? Again, targeting this idea of that, like as you mature, your tastes should mature, and you know we are a mature cigarette. So uh, come to where the flavor is. Again, this implied personal connection. And here's where we're going to get really recent. This is a Reagan presidential campaign poster from 1980. Um, maybe you knew, maybe you haven't knew, known, but Ronald Reagan was president from 1981 to 1989, and he was a Republican, and his tagline from the 1980 election was, let's make America great again. If that sounds familiar, if it's giving you like, uh, if, if I'm giving you trigger, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but we, we have to learn from history. Hopefully we can learn from history. Um, so, also, the let's, let us, again, is this, we're teammates. We're in this together. It's speaking to you. It's an implied you. We're in this together. Let's, hey, you and me, you with Reagan, we're going to make America great again. Now, of course, no talk of make America great again can be, uh, there he is. How can we avoid it? Uh, so make America great again. Obviously, an incredibly successful slogan. Um, I don't think it's going to become much of a surprise that it's a slogan that has done a lot of harm. It's a harmful slogan. It's a racist slogan, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but it has this implied personal connection, and it speaks to a certain audience that wants to go back before today for their various reasons. But let's come together and defeat Trump. There's that let's, you and I, we're in this together. Come run in with Joe and Barack and we'll defeat the president and we'll make America <laughs> great again, right? So it's this personal connection, it's this sense of teamwork, personal connection, sense of teamwork. Um, the idea of we, we need to protect Medicare, donate money to my campaign, the idea of we, that we're a team, came out of World War I, but it was really used in World War II. 
I'm not going to talk too much about World War II graphic design because any talk of World War II propaganda that doesn't do a deep dive on Nazi propaganda is incomplete. And that's just a very important subject that I don't want to gloss over. Um, but I, of course, I wanted to say when we're talking about we, you know, Rosie the Riveter, we can do it is, is a very, very effective poster. Now, one last concept uh, from World War I is demonizing the enemy. Make the enemy look like a monster. Make them look evil because then it's easier to kill them because then it makes it more urgent. Uh, beat back the Hun. The Hun was the slang for the Germans. And you can see uh, he's got these blood, the bloody bayonet and the bloody fingers. Here, this is a German soldier. This is a, you would everybody would have known as a German soldier by that particular helmet with the bloody knife, right? In the ruined town, right? Uh, demonizing the enemy. But demonizing the enemy was done on all sides. It was done on all sides. This is an American poster. Destroy this mad brute, showing Germany as this King Kong mad crazed animal gonna destroy the world. Incidentally, this is before the movie King Kong was produced. So um, get, you know, getting it in the right order. Uh, the, 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 this, this barbaric monster of Germany is going to destroy the world. And by the way, they're gonna rape the women, right? That, that image of the defenseless maid being taken away. Uh, side note, this was a cover of Vogue magazine from April of like 2010, I think, something like that. Uh, can I read the date? Doesn't have the year on it, but um, that was very rightly, people were like, oh, uh, that's a little weirdly racist in its historical context. So, uh, you know, I, I think that Giselle and LeBron's agents probably lost their job after that. Somebody needed to lose their job after that. So demonizing the enemy, back to that. Will you fight now or will you wait for this, right? So here you can see uh, they're sh showing the German soldiers as killing innocent people, killing civilians, burning the villages down. Um, remember Belgium, right? The burning the villages down, they're evil. Here's a German poster depicting the British. This was done on all sides. You demonize the enemy to make them less. And if they make them less than, then they're easy to kill. They're easy to dismiss. They're easy to ignore. They're easy to um, treat poorly. Uh, the Entente Cordiale. Uh, the Allies, the British and the French and the Americans, they were called the, uh, the, the, the Triple Entente. But here it's showing the Triple Entente is actually being controlled by the British and the British is this big hairy spider spinning a web around Europe and around the globe to control everyone. If you see, there's a web spun around Uncle Sam. There's a web spun around what I think is supposed to represent Canada. There's a web spun around a dark skinned man in a turban who's supposed to represent India. But in the mouth of this British spider is a French soldier. So this was probably distributed from airplanes over the French battle lines, as in to say like, your British allies are using you to control for world domination. So again, demonizing the enemy, sowing dissent amongst allies, Defi divide and conquer. Here's a German poster, extremely racist. The German at the bottom just simply means it's France's fault. Uh, Liberté, égalité, fraternité, they sure sound great. Uh, I hope you can hear the irony in my voice. Um, they sure sound great, except who's bringing liberty, equality, and brotherhood? This extremely racist depiction of an uh, African soldier from the French army. And incidentally, this on the right is probably meant to represent a um, a Jewish businessman. So there's some there's a dash of anti-Semitism anti in here too. Speaking of anti-Semitism, demonize, fabricate, and scapegoat the enemy. This is a German poster from World War II, or leading up to World War II. Uh, and it, it means it's his fault. It's to the war, it's his fault. Uh, you can see the yellow star, the kind of uh, racial stereotype features of this uh, 
sort of like Penguin from the Batman movies. Uh, again, this kind of racist depiction of a Jewish person. Demonize, fabricate, and scapegoat the enemy. Not doing a deep dive on the German propaganda here, but this is uh, kind of necessary at this point. When Mexico is sending its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're bringing rapists, and some, I presume, are good people. Demonize, fabricate, and scapegoat the enemy. If you can point to an enemy and unite people at hating someone else, unite people in hatred against something. Unite people by hating something else. It's not an old tactic. It's not a new tactic. It's a, it's a forever tactic. And again, this brings me to why this class is important, why this class, why this subject is important, because we continue to see this. We can continue to need to call it out. We need to continue to decipher it, deconstruct it, and dismantle it. More examples. Uh, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Uh, I just spoke to the governor, Tim Waltz, and told him that the military is with them all the way. Any difficulty, and we will assume control. But when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Thank you. Demonize, fabricate, and scapegoat the enemy. Add a dash of anti-Semitism. Crooked Hillary makes history. Most corrupt candidate ever. The red star, very reminiscent of the yellow star of David. So that's why I said add a dash of anti-Semitism. Demonizing the enemy is done on all sides, right? Donald Trump, too reckless and dangerous. Anti-Trump ads, anti-Hillary ads. They showed him in an evil light as well. Uh, and viciously telling the people of the United States, the greatest and most powerful nation on earth, how our government is to be run. Why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came and then go back and show us how? Why are we having all these people from shithole countries come here? We need to build a wall to keep them out. And I'm gonna autograph that wall. We can laugh at this, but this speaks very powerfully to some people. And divide and conquer, divide and conquer. Now, I don't wanna end on, how's my time? Uh, I don't think it will go a little long. Uh, I don't wanna end on this guy. So I'm gonna bring it back to Emmett McBain because he's totally awesome. And I wanna end on a, on a positive note. It may not fit with the theme, but let's, let's leave with a better taste in our mouths. Um, Emmett McBain had great success doing album covers for jazz and popular music. These are all wonderful and beautiful and colorful, but the success wasn't satisfying for him personally. He wanted to do something for um, the civil rights movement. He wanted to do something for the black community. So he starts to uh, make ads that are specifically for uh, the African-American community. So black ball, black book, black boy, black eye, black Friday, black hand, black heart, black jack, black magic, black male, black market, black Maria, black mark, little black Sambo, white lies. Black is beautiful. There's one true statement on there and it's the bottom one. And it, you know, ads like this is again, why, why I love Emmett McPain. Great graphic designer, but when he's crossing design with a purpose, it's just blurring that art and design. The line between them becomes so blurred, it doesn't even matter. Like an artist like Jenny Holzer or, um, or Barbara Kruger are very much like that. What color is black? Uh, black is the color of my little brother's mind, the gray streaks in my mother, I'm reading poetry to you all. Um, black is the color of my little brother's mind, the gray streaks in my mother's hair. Black is the color of my yellow cousin's smile, the scars upon my neighbor's wrinkled face. The color of the blood we lose, the color of our eyes is black. Our love of self, of others, brothers, sisters, people of a thousand shades of black, all one. Black is the color of the feeling that we share, the love we must express, the color of our strength is black. This is an ad for the Burrell McBain advertising uh, agency from Chicago. Emma McBain is from Chicago. Here is the Vincent Crullers advertising uh, company from Chicago. And Tom Burrell and Emmett McBain, they created the Burrell McBain Inc. 1971, specifically because they wanted to be making 
ads for the black community rather than having the big powerful white design firms deciding they wanted to uh, do it for themselves. Here's a really wonderful, sexy uh, Emmett McBain ad for Kent Cigarettes. Uh, and here's another one from Kent Cigarettes by Emmett McBain, Kent Smokes, and that's where it's at. And they have this kind of like hip 70s slang lingo to them. The last one that I want to talk about, Emmett McBain, again, for the Afro Sheen uh, hair product, Wantu Wazuri is Swahili, meaning the good people. And um, again, it's a beautiful ad, it's effective, it's powerful, it's affirmative, and it's a family. It's this connection where they're looking out at us. You know, I don't see myself as a white person, as a white man. I don't see myself in that. And that's actually its strength because there's a lot of ads that I see myself in. And um, anyway, so there it is. That's, and I, and like David Letterman, I am out of here. No, um, we've got 15 minutes, I guess, for questions or whatever. Uh, I'm gonna end my slideshow, stop my share. Okay, hi, everybody. Hello, we were clapping over here, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I, I heard the claps despite the mute. That's that's wonderful. We had to move. Um, we had some audio issues in the other room. So I'm joined again by my class. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Um, and thank you so much. That was really fascinating. I learned a lot and especially about the Chicago um, connections at the end. Yeah. I met McBain. I yeah. thought that was really great. Yeah, um, he's, he's great. Um, I'll, you know, Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine, those were started in Chicago. Johnson Public Publishing Inc. was, it was in Chicago. They're closed down now. They, the offices are closed because magazines are, you know, dead. But, um, and, and, you know, and that's a whole other thing I can talk about, about like why Ebony was so great and why Jet Magazine was, was so important as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's cool to like, as I'm taking the train downtown, I see the building with Ebony and Jet on, yeah. you know, in neon. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you got to check out the, the I'll, I'll send you a link, but there's a, there's um, my, my friend is a photographer in Chicago and she photographed the offices after they closed down the offices. And just the design is just the wallpaper and everything is just so cool. So mm -hmm. cool. Oh, I love it. Yeah, please do send me those. Um, so I want to open it up to any questions or comments. Um, we do have one, it looks like, um, in the chat box. Do you think the last form of ads demonizing the enemy, here we go, um, are going to be the norm from now on? Um, <laughs> how, is, my, is my glass half full or half empty, right? Um, <laughs> I would hope that it becomes less and less. Um, I, 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 I think it's the norm. I think it's the norm. I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's human nature. Um, it's human nature. It's always been like that. Uh, I, I, I hope that we can get, you know, um, the quotas, I'm going to misquote, but, you know, get, you know, ride the backs of our better angels. I think that something like that would be, would be wonderful. Um, I think that, Humanity is flawed, and we need to just constantly check ourselves and remind ourselves. Um, but there will always be people that are going to want to get success through at any means necessary, and that's going to mean through threats, violence, and racism. Yeah. 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 Good question. Um, Great question. I'm sorry. I don't have a, po a more uplifting <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I guess one of my questions was, I mean, we know that propaganda has existed for such a long time, you know, like some of the earlier examples that come to my mind are like ancient Mesopotamia or, you know, ancient Egypt. Yeah. Um, so I guess, what do you think was unique about the situation of World War I? Is it just a confluence of, you know, the time and the technology is kind of coming together um, that leads us into the birth of modern manipulation and advertising? Yeah, I, I think you have to just rem remember the industrial revolution, right? So more and faster. 
more printing, uh, you know, mass media, truly mass media, is when you're looking at an ancient Roman statue as propaganda, it's one statue in one place, you know, the, and, and that serves as the propaganda. Look at how great Augustus Caesar is. You know, he looks great. He looks, it's very effective propaganda, but you can't print 30,000 six foot marble statues, but you can print 30,000 of these posters in the industrial revolution like that. So the, um, combine the more and faster of printing with the more and faster of killing because world war one was the truly the first industrialized war uh there are other skirmishes leading up to it but you know the the mass production of weapons the mass production millions and millions of bombs in world war one like the 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 battles went um Death went from, in a battle, went from 100 people in a battle to 10,000 people in a battle from one war to the next. So I, I, I think that it was just truly the industrialization of it all. And combine that with the, the, the new era thing, the, the, 20th, the turn to the 20th century. The turn to the 20th century was, from my readings, I, said, I wasn't there. I couldn't. I'm, I'm not Captain America. I wasn't there. Um, I'm not. I'm not. He wasn't there either. It was fictional. I mean, he was born in World War II. But anyway. Um, but from everything that I can, I can gather. My impression is that the turn from the 19th century to the 20th century had a much bigger kind of like excitement than the turn from the 20th century to the 21st century. From when we were going from the 2000s, from the uh, from the 1900s to the 2000s. The general vibe was more like uh, Y2K, uh, what's going to happen? There wasn't nearly the, the kind of like, I'm so excited for this new era. And it was a new millennium, but we weren't like thrilled about it. We were apprehensive. We had anxiety about it. But the transition from 1899 to 1900 really was like a new era, a new century. Oh my gosh, what's modern technology going to bring to us? It's going to make the world so much better, or the Industrial Revolution, this new era. And then of course, like... It brought the war, which disgruntled old, you know, short history. It brought the war. The world's going to be great. It brought the war. And then you get Dada as a result. And, you know, so. All right. Uh, there was a question here. It's interesting to think that if we ever got into World War III, the propaganda would look like now. We're, I would, this is going to sound like hyperbolic, but in a way, we're already in a World War III when it comes comes down to um propaganda in the the digital sphere it's a war for uh your your minds for your bandwidth it's a war for your your dollars um and, and you know I, I hope this doesn't sound uh too hyperbolic but uh, but i think that it's part of why i i want us to be so aware of this is that um this manipulation is all it's already happening it's constantly happening um you know, if you think of when the, the next time you're on instagram and you're scrolling through just count how many ads you see and then compare that ratio of how many ads you see versus like pictures of your friends and well there's already a war going on. That's um, sorry. I'm, I'm not. I, I, I need to. I'm so pessimistic. I guess. Um, I just wanted to answer the question: Was um, is this going to be uploaded to somewhere so people can you, um, watch it afterwards? I am going to upload it to our YouTube channel, and I'm just trying to find the uh, link to drop it in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, Jason Zingsheim, Dr. Zingsheim, has a question. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi, thank you, Dr. Siebert, um, and thank you for this presentation. It's, it's been amazing. Uh, and to kind of continue on with the conversation, I was wondering as we move into this kind of fight uh, for against misinformation and disinformation, so much of this is happening in social media with posts that look like they're from normal people instead of things that are clearly designed by designers and artists. Yes. So I'm wondering, as we're in this war, moving forward, what do you think could be or should be the role of artists and designers in engaging with it on whatever side 
but they're on here. So there's um, there's a famous design manifesto called First Things First that that I that I that I'm thinking of, and First Things First was written in the '60s as sort of a way to kind of say, hey, there's more to being a designer than being an advertiser. There's more to being a designer than being a propagandist. That uh, designing to sell more t-shirts is a thing and that's fine. We're not gonna really cast judgment on that, but designers can make a lot of positive change if they employ their tools for, for good. Um, and the, you know, I teach in the graphic design department at, at FIT and the students in the graphic design department are very much in graphic design because they want to try and make the world a better place. They're very concerned about what their job is gonna be, but they are also very concerned about using the tools and the skills that they're learning to try and make the world a better, a better place. So um, the war of, of information and disinformation and the war to fight disinformation is, is huge and you know we're all in education we're all educators we're all in school we all know that education is the is the way out is the solution is is the best weapon against it because you can make people aware but you're absolutely right when you say like the blurred lines of like things being intentionally designed to look amateurish so that they don't feel like they're designed they feel organic that's a, that's absolutely a strategy and, but the thing about that strategy is that's not a new strategy either. Um, that strategy has been done before. Saul Bass used that strategy. Saul Bass was like a 60s designer, did uh, movie titles. He used this very primitive like paper cutout technique that was literally paper cutouts that looked like they were done by amateurs and children. And, his, and the idea was to make it more human, more relatable so that it didn't seem like it was an advertisement, so it didn't seem like it was designed. So, um, you know, uh, this this subject is hugely important because of because of that. I don't really have an answer other than to continue the conversation. The conversation of like, yeah, yeah, that that's helpful. Thank you. And I think also pointing out the the way that designers and artists can use their skills for good for making the world a better place. And I also see that tying into the work that you showed from McBain. That there is a history to that as well too for sure for sure yeah for sure yeah you know there's um there's a there's always a conflict in design schools between the advertising department and the gra graphic design department no always a bit of a conflict there um well i think uh this might be a good spot to wrap up since um we were talking about continuing the conversation uh <laughs> So I think we should continue the conversation in our different circles. And I want to thank everyone. First of all, I want to thank you, uh, Bernardo, Justin Campoy, for your time thank for you. this fascinating talk. Um, and thank our audience as well. Um, looks like we have a lot of students from across the university, a lot of names I don't recognize. And thank you to That's the great. professors who invited their students as well. Great. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank and you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Thank um, Professor Seifert. Would it be would it be helpful if I sent you this presentation? Would that be? A, yeah, a that would be great. If you don't okay. mind, I can share. Not at all. Not at all. Anyone Not else all. like it? <laughs> yeah, I'll send it to you, and then then they they can have it. Absolutely. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. For Thank you for your event. time. And uh, keep your eyes open. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Night.